Tonight on today's message is, Will My Faith Save Me? It's a question I think all of us really need to dwell on and think about, and I hope that in the next few moments, uh, you'll be thinking on it, dwelling on it. You know, there are things in life that are extremely important, and there are other things that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. There are things that it's okay to be wrong about, and it's not really going to harm you that much. For example, I know a lot of you think blue's a nice color. We prefer orange at our house, but I mean... Uh, everybody's got their opinions and ideas. When you're going somewhere you haven't been in a while and, and your wife says, this doesn't really look familiar. And you, you say, no, I'm sure this is the way. And she says, why don't you pull over and ask some directions? And you say, no, I got this. Just be quiet. Well, you'll just be a little bit later by the time you decide to pull over and get directions and get turned around. I mean, there's, there's, there's things in life that just, they're not life-changing you can, you can afford to be wrong about those things. You can afford to be careless about those things. But when it comes to the question of what does it take for a person to be saved, you can't afford to get this wrong. The, the stakes are just too high. In fact, the stakes are eternal. Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 16, of a rich man and a man named Lazarus who was a poor beggar. And there's, there's so many things that we learn from that story. But as the rich man is suffering in torment, and he, and he cries out for Abraham to send somebody back to warn his brothers about this place. One of the things that we learn from that is that once we step out into eternity... Our destination is sealed forever. There's no second chance to believe in Christ. There's no second chance to accept the gospel. And so it's very important that we understand what it takes to be saved. Now in James, in this passage, he talks about the issue of faith. One of the reasons that people often have a hard time communicating it's because sometimes we use the same word to mean different things. In fact, uh, one of the most frustrating things you may find in witnessing is witnessing to some cults who will take the words that we use but redefine them and use them in a different way. And so you try to say to them, Jesus is our Savior. And they'll say, yes, He is my Savior. And I'll say, Jesus died for our sins. The Bible teaches this. And they say, yes, Jesus died for our sins. And you have to keep asking all these questions until you finally get them to admit or, or maybe understand that what they mean by those words are not what we mean by those words. And when we think about faith, people can use faith in all kinds of different ways. And people can also say something about themselves that is not true. Should be self-evident and obvious to all of us, but James deals with this issue in the passage that we're at today. That just because you say you have faith does not mean that you have faith. And just because you have something that you refer to as faith does not mean that you have the kind of faith that leads to salvation. So it's important that we understand what faith is, and it's important that we examine ourselves and ask whether we possess this type of faith or not. So James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 would you join me in standing as we read God's Word? James chapter 2, verse 14. This is what the Bible says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person? That faith apart from works is useless? Was it not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, 
and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand a passage that has been misunderstood by so many people. And Lord, I pray that the very intent that you had for James's hearers and for us today, Lord, I pray that we would hear this message and I pray that we would respond to it in faith and obedience. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, everything in life when it comes to communication is important to keep it in context. I don't think very many of us would ever take a letter and pull out one sentence and think that we could understand what it was talking about without reading the rest of the letter. And so it is with the book of James. We think about what James is dealing with. And if you've been here the past few weeks, we covered a passage where James talks about partiality in the church. Apparently, there was a problem in the church that James was writing to and dealing with of showing partiality to wealthy people and shunning poor people. And so James talks about if a, if a wealthy person comes in and they're finely dressed and you say to them, why don't you sit in this place of honor? But then another person comes in and they're poorly dressed and, and you basically uh, shun them and you say, well, why don't you just go stand over there? He said, haven't you become judges with evil thoughts? And so James is talking about how we relate to people and how we deal with other people. Luke deals with this extensively in his gospel as well. You see, how we relate to people is a demonstration of what we believe and who we are inside. And that's why Jesus said, they will know you by your love for one another. When we begin to interact with other people on the basis of love, because God has changed us and we're no longer interacting with people on the basis of our sinful nature, thinking about how this will benefit us and what we can get from a relationship. Instead, when we operate on the basis of love, thinking about how can we serve and how can we give back out of gratitude for what Jesus has done for us, then what we're doing is evidence of what Christ has done in us. And so it's in this context of talking about how we relate to people and how we relate to people who can't help us. It was also, James, in this letter that talks about that true religion is to help widows and orphans in their affliction. And so James is talking about people in society that need help, that have n no means whatsoever to ever repay us or help us back. And so James says that when we are caring for the least of the people, when we stand to receive no benefit, but instead we speak a kind word, we give a needed gift, we provide a necessary service, and we do it merely by love. We are demonstrating that Christ has done a work in us and he's changed us. And that that, that work of kindness is evidence of our faith. You see, we are saved to serve. Many people think about salvation being a change in our eternal destiny. And salvation will change your eternal destiny, but it will also change your present. And so God saves us, and then he gives us something to do, and he gives us a new way to relate to people around us. And so notice verse 14, what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? You see, saving faith causes us want to serve people. I want you to notice two words that, that's very important. We don't just skim over or we'll miss the point of what James is saying. The first one is the word good. Notice verse 14 again. He says, what good is it? What good is it? Now, he's not talking about good versus bad, but he's talking about usefulness and, and, and benefit. And so he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works 
In, in other words, how does it benefit anybody for somebody to be saved if they don't live any different from when before they claim to be saved? And so he says, what good is it? And then I want you to notice the second word here. It's the word says. He says, if someone says he has faith but does not have works. He, say, he doesn't say that somebody has faith and does not have works, but he says, what if somebody says that they have faith but does not have works? James is not talking about what people are. He's talking about what people are claiming to be. And just because somebody claims that they're a Christian does not mean that they're a Christian. The latest Gallup poll on Christianity in America, 2015, they did a, a survey poll to ask people about their faith. In that poll in 2015, 75% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. 75%. That's, that's an enormous percentage. 75% of Americans, when polled and asked about their faith, identified themselves as Christians. I want you to understand this. There is no possible way that 75% of Americans are Christians. There's just no possible way. If that were true, crime would be different in America. If that were true, television would be different in America. If that were true, frankly, politics would be different in America. And if that were true, we would be living in a totally different place. Just because somebody says that they're a Christian does not mean that they are a Christian. And so James says if somebody says they have faith, he's not talking about people that have faith and don't have any works. And we'll talk in a moment more about what those are. But consider this scenario to help us understand. Listen to what he says in verses 15 through 17. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So James gives this scenario here, and he says, if a brother or sister. So he's talking about somebody who's in the faith and somebody that you know. So, so let, let's, let's maybe rephrase it like this, just in, in our context. If you're sitting in Sunday school, and somebody that's in your class, always been in your class, and you know them, they lean over in the middle of class and say, you know, I don't know if you heard or not, but my wife's been real sick, and, and I, I miss so much work taking her into chemo and everything. I, I lost my job. and The truth is we haven't eaten in three days. This is really embarrassing, but. Is there any way maybe we could have some leftovers uh, from you guys this week? Anything that you, that you could spare? What one of us would lean back over and say, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope things get better for you. Good luck this week. Maybe it'll be better next week. How is that going to help anybody? And what kind of person, as affluent and well-off as most of us are, and the reality is even the poorest of us, we're affluent by worldly standards. Not many of us in here are really struggling to figure out how we're going to get our next meal. We've got people in Madisonville in that condition and I'm very thankful that we have the food pantry and the different ministries. And I want you to know that, that as a church, we help people all week long. We do. We've been paying electric bills to get people's uh, heat back on. We've been providing food we, all week long. As a church, we help people. But among this congregation this morning, let's be not, not many of us are in that condition. Most of us could take a family out to lunch and, and, and never miss it. And so if God has blessed us so much, what kind of a person with the means to help somebody would, would lean over to somebody in that kind of need that you know is not in that condition of their own doing? 
They're not like that because they've been out spending all their money on drugs. They're not like that because they've been out and gambled and squattered everything away. They're not like that because they're not willing to work. This is somebody that you know, a brother or a sister in Christ. What kind of a person would look at their need and say, well, man, I wish you the best. We'll think about you when we eat at Oasis today. You say, that'd be a very cold-hearted person. Absolutely it would. And that's what James is talking about. He says, how can you look at somebody that would respond like that and ever think that they are a believer? If Christ has changed your life, how could you not have some compassion for somebody who's in need? And so you say, God, when he saved us, he called us to serve people. And and sometimes serving people has absolutely nothing to do with money or giving things away. Some people need a prayer when they're sick. Some people need a visit when they're lonely. Some people need an encouraging word when they're discouraged. There's many ways that we meet the needs of people. What James is saying is this is why God has saved us, so that we can help people. And when we love people and we see their need and we want to do something, it's evidence that God has changed our life and saved us. And so the people that James is talking about here, that there is nothing in their life that would demonstrate that God has made a difference. And so verses 18 18 through 19, saving faith, uh, the kind of faith that is that it takes to be saved, saving faith is different from demonic faith. Listen to what he says in verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have works. So here's James's response. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, now the key word here is show. You see, you can't show your faith without pointing to something that you have done. You can claim faith, and you can describe your faith, and you can explain your faith with mere words. But you can't show your faith without pointing to something that you have done and so in the people in James's day who who many were perhaps uh, counting on good works to be saved we fast forward 2,000 years very little has changed many people are counting on good works to be saved good works will not save you but good works do demonstrate That there's something going on in your life. And so James says, show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Well, verse 19, we talk about a demonic faith. This is what he says. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You see, demonic faith... In other words, having the kind of faith like a demon has is a faith that's simply the mere belief of facts. These people said, well, James, we have faith. We believe that God is one, just like the Bible teaches. And as followers of Jesus and confessing that Jesus, that God was one, they were confessing their faith in the divinity and the deity of Jesus. As all of us should. But what James is saying is that if that is all you have, you don't have anything more than a demon has. The demons believe that Jesus is God. The demons believe that God exists. The demons believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Demons believe the facts, but they're not saved. And when we're talking about faith, Saving faith is much more than believing facts about something. Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 34 describes one of the encounters with a demon. It says, And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, listen to his confession. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Acts 16, 16, Paul talks about having to deal with the 
demons. He says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. This demon through this woman professed that the message that they spoke about Jesus Christ, they spoke as servants of the Most High God. James is saying, if you believe that Jesus existed, you believe that he was the Son of God, you believe he died for people's sins, you believe he rose from the dead, that's, that's good. But even demons believe that. Believing facts will not bring about your conversion, and they will not save you. Faith in Christ is more than believing facts. For many years, preachers have been telling the story of Charles Blondine, the famous tightroper who uh, crossed Niagara Falls. It's a great story. I, I hope you've heard it, and if you've heard it before, I hope that you'll listen again. Because if we think about this, this story, it illustrates to us the difference between claiming something and actually trusting in something. In 1860, Charles Blondine, who was a French tightroper, he crossed Niagara Falls. He was the first person to ever do this on a tightrope. It was 11,000 feet across, over a quarter of a mile. Well, he not only did it once, he did it multiple times. And, and each time that he did it, he said he was going to make it more daring, and he would take along more difficult things with him. At one point, he pushed a wheelbarrow across the tightrope. And getting to the other side, reporters that were there that day said the roar of the crowd was so loud you could not hear the falls. And as the crowd roared, Blondine said, I need a volunteer. And then he said, who wants to ride in the wheelbarrow? Nobody volunteered to get in the wheelbarrow. At this point, Blondine had crossed back and forth several times on multiple occasions. And they had seen him do it. Two weeks later, he crossed Niagara Falls again. But this time, Harry Colcord, who was his manager, climbed on his back and riding piggyback style on his back, he let Blondine carry him from one side of the falls to the other. You see, all the crowd said that they believed. But only Blinding's manager put his faith and trust in him. I would never encourage you to trust in a person, not a human person. But friend, when we come to the point about Jesus, then instead of standing in the back and saying, well, I believe he was the son of God. And the preacher, we hear the preacher say, well, he died for our sins. And we say, I know that's right. We hear the preacher say, he rose from the dead. And we say, I, I, I know that's true. When, when we move from the point of simply agreeing with facts and believing facts, and instead we place our entire trust in him and risk everything to follow Jesus, that's the kind of faith that saves a person. It's not believing things about Jesus. It's trusting in Jesus. You see, when we stand before God someday, if we need something other than the righteousness of Christ, I'm in serious trouble because that's all I'm trusting in. If you have to be baptized by the Pope, I'm not going to make it to heaven. If your good works have to outweigh your bad works, I'm not going to make it to heaven. But if as Jesus claimed, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, if that is true, i got a bright future. And so does every other person who's trusted in him. Because I've not just believed that Jesus existed. 
or that he died or that he rose from the dead. I have risked my entire life and my eternal destiny to follow him. And I would urge you to do the same. Saving faith doesn't come about by simply believing in facts. It comes by trusting in Jesus. And when you trust in Jesus, then you listen to what he says and you begin to follow him. And it causes you to live differently. And that's why you can look at things in your life and things that you, can, that you have done. And you can point to those things. And someone who says, show me your faith. I say, I'll show you my faith. Here, here's what I've done. You want to see my faith? Look, look at my checkbook register. See what I've done with my money. It'll, it'll show my faith. You want to see my faith? Look at what I've done with my time. It'll show my faith. You want to see my faith? Look at how I've responded to people and their need. It'll show my faith. We ought to have works that demonstrate our faith. You see, we're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And that was James's point. Listen to verses 20 through 26. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was it not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Whereas the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. James gives two examples from the Old Testament. He mentions Abraham and he mentions Rahab. And some people have said, well now pastor, uh, Paul says that we're not justified by works, but James says that we're justified by works. You need to understand this. Paul, when he used the term works, was talking about works of the law. James was talking about keeping the Old Testament law. That's what he was referring to when he said we're not saved by works. Because none of us are able to keep the Old Testament law in its entirety. What James is talking about here when he talks about works is he's talking about service and kindness to others. He's talking about acts of love. And James is not saying that if you simply do nice things to other people, you'll be saved. He's saying that people that are saved do nice things to other people. People that are saved demonstrate it through a changed lifestyle. People that are saved have actions that they didn't have before they were saved. They have motives that they had that they didn't have before they were saved. And so Abraham, because he didn't just merely say that he believed God. But instead, when, when God said, I want you to take your only son up on the mountain, I want you to sacrifice him. Did he do it? No, God stopped him. He attempted to because he believed God and responded in obedience. And in that obedience, he demonstrated his true faith. And the Bible is crystal clear that God never intended for Abraham to kill his son. He simply wanted Abraham to see that he had faith that would follow and believe God anywhere. And you know, the New Testament will go on later to explain what Abraham was thinking. The New Testament says that Abraham believed in the promise and believed that God could even raise his son from the dead. You see, Abraham believed. And Abraham's belief was a total, complete trust in God. Abraham was not someone who said he believed, but didn't really. And because Abraham's faith was real and sincere, it led him to do things that demonstrated his faith. So it was true about Rahab. She believed that God was with the nation of Israel. And that's why she received the messengers and sent them out a different way. Listen to what Jesus said about this issue. Matthew 3 Verses 8 through 9, Jesus said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit 
the fruit are the things that we produce in our lives. And as we grow and we begin to understand this, we realize that it's not us that's producing the fruit, but it's the Spirit that's working through us. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That phrase, in keeping, means bear fruit consistent with your confession of repentance. Here's what it means. It means if you've repented, live like it. And somebody that's repented, you ought to be able to look at their life and you ought to be able to see things that are evidence of their repentance. In verse 9, this is what he says, And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. He was talking about the Jews who thought that they were saved simply because of the fact that they were Jews. And they had to repent just like we have to repent. He says, For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. 75% of Americans say that they're Christians. If we're Christians, we need to live like it. We need to be different people. We need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If someone is saved and they live no different, well, what good is that? That's James' point. Faith without works is dead. So if you have faith, let's show the world our faith. Let's show the world our faith by what we do, by how we live. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that James speaks with such clarity about practical issues. And what I pray that you help us not to be people that profess to be something that we're not, but to be genuine, true followers of your son. May the things that we do cause other people to want to follow him. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.